Welcome to Creative Cooking in Ani's Kitchen. My name is Ani, and today I'm going to bring you um, my method on kind of pickling and storing salad, you know, vegetables in a jar. You don't need a refrigerator. You just put it in these uh, gallon jars. It's sealed tight with an airtight lid. And it keeps, um, like I said, you don't need a refrigerator. My jars will be here tomorrow. I thought I had enough, but when I went to look in the box, there was only four little ones left. I am going to put some in those little jars uh, to keep in the refrigerator just to have, you know, to pick on and kind of nibble on. And um, but let me show you. Pretty much the setup that I have here. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of, uh, I got peppers, green, red, I said red, red. Um, I've got some greens, okay. The ends need to be cut, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to slice them up. Um, I've got some tri-color coleslaw. It's got carrots in there. Um some cabbage and carrots I've got from my garden I got the uh, little mini sweet peppers okay these are Brussels sprouts little baby cabbages that I'm also going to slice up I got some parsley back here there's more vegetables down here I think I've got a squash yep I got a zucchini I've got some salad pickles um, I got some of those Let's see, here's another one. I know I have a zucchini in here somewhere. But anyway, it's in there, trust me. And um, that should be everything. And then, of course, like I said, the tomatoes I have here. So I'm going to season it. Those are my seasonings over there. That's fresh, crushed tomatoes. I've got some parsley bunches here. As you can see, I got that. I got dill. I got whole black peppercorn, uh, bay leaves, rosemary, garlic and onion powder, some ginger, salt, of course, paprika, and my vinegar. Here I go. I'm going to slice away. And you see that big pot? over there that big caldero okay that is what i'm going to put all of these vegetables into i'll season it and then i'll cover it put it in the refrigerator to marinate and tomorrow it'll be ready for jarring all right so let me show you what i got going on here and how i do this i have my garbage can over here to my left okay and this cute little thing right here is to uh, help me to fill the jars up, you know, put a cup there. Okay, first thing I want to do is cut up my cabbage. I want to get that stem out of there. Okay, slice it right in half. Remove the stem, slice it in half. Remove the stem. Okay. So anyway, we are, uh, like I said, we're getting ready for the fall. We were going to do a barbecue, uh, kind of a picnic here and to welcome the fall in and but then we decided for Labor Day weekend that we would take the camper out for one additional ride, okay, before winterizing it. And we're going to get an enclosure for it and stuff like that. Uh, it's parked at the side of the house. But, um, so we decided for Labor Day weekend, we go and 
the fishing site, you know. And so we're going to um, a campsite right nearby, not too far away. It's in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. And we got the last site, a campsite available. Boy, we caught that one just in time. Everything else, everywhere else is completely booked, solid, for Labor Day weekend. So we kind of lucked out on that, and I guess uh, that's where God wants us to go. And uh, it was fairly decent, three, three nights for a uh, hundred bucks. Yeah, lakes, pool, all the amenities. You know, laundromat, showers, not that we're going to need any of that, but I'm just saying, it's nice. Nice to know. I don't really do uh, public showers and pools. I just, you know, if it's my pool or someone I know, you know, that I know that they take care of their pools and they treat their pools and you know, that's different in that they're pretty clean, respectable people. <laughs> that's one thing. But a public pool, not that I, I'm not frowning on anybody who uses it. For me, just not my thing. Used to be when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. I didn't care then. Mm-mm. It was all about getting wet and getting out of the heat, going swimming. Yeah, so, but now as a grown-up, well, you start getting a little bit more choicey, <laughs> or should I say choosy? <laughs> eh, you learn a thing or two, right? It's like that insurance. What's that insurance? We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. <laughs> whatever but uh yeah the older you get you know wisdom does uh begin with the reverence of god and then from there <laughs> you start listening more and more as you get older you know eyes to see and ears to hear as he says But anyway, so I'm going to chop all these vegetables up. I know you don't want to see it all. So I'll be cutting in. I'll be cutting in and out. So I can show you a little bit of everything and not make you bored watching me slice all this stuff up. You know what I mean? I've been busy, you all. I hadn't had uh, all the opportunities that I wanted to, to edit, you know, and post, but I'm getting there now. Now that I've got a lot of my major appointments out the way, you see what I'm saying? Okay, pickle time. I'm just grabbing whatever I grab first. I'm not a fast chopper. First of all, I can't do it these numbers, that's for sure. Secondly, I'm... <laughs> I'm too heavy-handed for all that noise. Yep. It's too early. I don't think it's even 8 o'clock yet. I haven't had breakfast. This is my breakfast. Vegetables. How about that? Here's another squash. The other squashy. So imagine, you know, you sit down and you spend... About an hour cutting up all this, these vegetables, tossing them around, mixing them up, adding the spices and vinegar. Then you put them in a jar and you got two big jars for the winter. This one roll right off the table. Okay, it's going to 
time to just transfer this into this big pot. I gotta be out of my mind do this early in the morning. But you know what? When you have as much going on as I do, and I'm not talking about a busy schedule, I'm talking about illnesses and, you know, you gotta get in where you fit in. Get yours when you can. It's my zucchini. Found it. I did get a couple of good nights sleep. Once I got prescribed the Ropinerol, 25 milligrams. Gave me such relief, I gotta tell you. I was like two weeks with restless, if not three. With restless leg syndrome was just getting worse. You know, every night, all day long, it was really, I was really under attack by the devil or Satan or his minions or whoever, evil spirits, I should say. I was really under attack and I prayed to God for relief and he answered not. It took three weeks, but check this out in the book of Daniel. How long did it take Gabriel? To, to, to get to Daniel and answer his prayer. God sent Gabriel to answer Daniel's prayer. He got stuck in the first heaven. Fighting all the... Rathiums and... Nephiliums and all that. And... Michael, the archangel, had to come down and help him so he could get through to answer David's prayer. And he told David, I've been on this mission to get to you to answer your prayer for 21 days, and you've been fast praying. Daniel didn't let up on his prayer. He kept going. He knew God was going to answer. He knew something was up. And uh, Gabriel told him, I've been trying to get to you for 21 days. I've, I've had to fight my way through. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't think that the supernatural exists and has power to render you ill or anything else, mm -hmm. take my advice and suit up. Put on the full armor of God because they're there. They sure are. And their biggest weapon against you is the fact that you don't believe or you don't take arms, you don't suit up like Father tells you to. Ephesians, what is it, 10 to 20? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6. Verse 10 to 20. Mm -hmm. Helmet of salvation. All that. You know, shield of faith. Sword of truth. Shod your feet. Gird yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with all prayer and supplications. That's your weapon. Prayer and supplication. Okay. There are... Five defenses, armor, defensive armor, I should say, and two weapons, prayer and supplication. Well, of course, your faith, and of course, that's in your prayer. You wouldn't pray unless you have faith. So, yeah, absolutely, sword of truth, that comes from Christ, Christ's mouth. Mm-hmm. Yep. But your prayer and supplication for right now, 
at your power. All in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. So I did that, and within three weeks, I got my prayers answered. I don't know how I got through videotaping stuff the way I did. I had to keep moving. That's one thing about RLS, restless leg syndrome. You have to keep moving. You, there's no such thing as staying still. If you sit still, you're going to end up punching everything in sight. Your fist through a wall. You're going to kick the dog. <laughs> I mean, you just, you know, kicking and punching and swinging and screaming, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, what do you call that? Involuntary reflex reaction. Yeah, it's bad. And it's not just your legs. It's, it's body. Restless body syndrome is what they should call it. Because it's your entire body and it's this horrible feeling that comes over. And it's like a hypersensitivity kind of thing to sound. And it's just a yucky, yucky feeling. But God has answered my prayers, so I'm thankful for that. I just want to share that with you all. Those of you who might be going through that, listen, there's a, a prescription called Requip. I think the generic is Ropinerol. Yeah. Talk to your doctor about that. See if you can't take that. My doctor started me out at 25 milligrams, and then you kind of build it up in your system, and you work your way up from there. You take one tablet for the first two nights, and then two tablets, uh, I guess until the prescription runs out. I don't know. I have to read the Bible again. I was just so grateful to get it. I get some rest. Oh, I was so happy. I thank Dr. Shammy for that. Well, my blood pressure is back to normal. I'm feeling better. One thing goes wrong, it affects everything else, especially when you have renal disease, you know, kidney disease. I think I have like 8% kidney function left, you know, or to date, I should say. So, yeah. It's important for me to maintain all of my levels, my albumin, my iron, everything was suffering. Phosphorus, every, after I had everything within go, everything just went haywire. Just one thing. With just one thing going wrong, it, uh, it sets everybody else off. Yeah. But, so for sure, getting back. <sighs> The best part is getting some sleep. But, you know, then I also have that tether spinal cord. Guess what? They just discovered that. I was born with it. And what that is is when you're born as a baby, you have your spinal cord and your spinal column. Okay? Your spinal cord is always shorter than your spinal column. Well, as the baby grows, as you grow, your spinal column grow right because you're growing so I grow well your spinal cord is supposed to shrink back just a little but it's supposed to stay back well mine got tangled up with the column and as the column grew the spinal cord grew and it's not meant to stretch like that well went through the military and everything and nobody knew it yeah and all it took was an MRI to discover. And, you know, all these years, now is when they decide to look because I started getting severe symptoms, probably brought on by the kidney disease. And I started getting severe symptoms, uh, back pain. I mean, all the way down my leg and... Then I started getting lumps in the back of my legs, like from the nerves, I guess, or something, or what they call from both. I don't know what it was, but the doctor was like, when she examined me, she's like, 
Okay, well, an x-ray is clearly not enough because she had done an x-ray and all she saw was a little bit of arthritis. And she thought that that was it. I said, Doc, it's not arthritis. I know the feeling from arthritis to this. This is totally different. So when I went back to her because the pain just said getting worse and worse and worse. That was all that nerve being tethered up. So I went back, I made another appointment, went right back to her with the same complaint. She examined me this time, found the lumps towards the back of my legs, they're gone now, and, and, and sent me for an MRI immediately, and boop, there it was, mm-hmm, yeah, I mean, they checked the hips to see if it was, you know, just in case it was the hips and stuff, and no, my hips are fine, parsley. Nope, nope, nope. This was a uh, tethered spinal cord syndrome. And I read that as if they catch you when you're young, they could go in and separate. You know, untether it. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't catch mine, so now it's too late. Can't do nothing about it. So I've got to live with it. So I'm like, okay, am I going to be on some kind of pain management? Something? Because according to the research I've done, this just gets progressively worse. It doesn't get better. Because as it's tethered, the more nerve damage it does, and it affects other organs. So it damages nerves that affect other organs, I should say. So it just messes everything. That's probably why I got kidney, uh, renal disease, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Play to do anything about it. So I'm asking her for some kind of a pain relief. I use a tube of capsaicin one a week just to, so that I can function, get out of bed and move. Yeah, cramping up. But I'm so used to it. You know, it's sad. When you get used to, have to get used to pain or living in pain, that's not how things are supposed to be. Well, my doctor said she don't believe in pain medication. How about pain management? You know, some local shots or something. Local meaning in the in the area where it hurts. Something. Um, she don't believe in pain medication because she said her husband had to have hip surgery. He had diagnosed with bad hips. He had to have hip surgery, which is why she made me go check my hips out. Imagine that, because her husband went through it, and that's what it was for him. But mine were fine. But because her husband got hooked on the pain meds they gave him, she don't believe in giving any out. I'm like, uh, I said, that's not my monkey, not my circus. You know, I'm a patient of you. You don't bring your personal life into your professional life. You took the Hippocratic oath. Where, where does that fall into all of this? Uh, I don't believe in it because my husband got addicted. So I'm not your husband. <laughs> I'm not your husband. I've been uh, on and off pain medication for many years living with this disease. And I've always been very responsible. I know the dangers of being, uh, you know, catching an addiction. I've seen a lot of people go down that route. But, you know, there are some people who have a very uh, strong, tolerance, um, immune system. You know, it's like the body builds up immune immunity to where it doesn't affect you anymore. So when it stops helping me, I start taking it. It's like aspirin and Tylenol. I got to switch. I got to switch my medications because my body gets used to it too quick. And that just doesn't work anymore. But that doesn't mean I go and reach for more. <laughs> you 
You know, I mean, I take my medications as prescribed, and when they're done, they're done. Or when they stop working, I report it. And and they'll give me, they'll, alter, they'll alternate me with something else. You know, but I really don't care about it being a narcotic. I want pain management. I want to get out of pain. So if you could find a way to do that for me, which I know there is, there's injections you can get in your back or wherever. I don't know. I haven't been. <laughs> you know, whatever you can do, do it. Don't just sit there and and gripe about how your husband got addicted. That's like I said, not my monkey, not my circus. That's got nothing to do with me. You took the Hippocratic Oath to help your patients. Where do I fall in in that category? Uh, are you just giving up on me now? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get nowhere with you. If that's the case, I want a different doctor. Because you're no longer helping me. Why see the, why see the same person that's not really doing anything for you? That's a waste of my time. I'm going through pain. No. <laughs> no. I don't tolerate that. Do your job. You know, everyone, because of the government, Congress, I guess, and everybody else, and uh, people abusing medications, doctors too, okay, because of that, they're so afraid, doctors, good doctors are so afraid now to prescribe necessary treatment. It's not like the diagnosis isn't there. You have good reason to prescribe them. I'm not even asking for a strong medication. I'm asking, what did I ask her for? Uh, something that uh, I got when they uh, did the peritoneal surgery. They try, I tried the peritoneal twice. It didn't, it didn't take. So I had to go with the fistula for hemodialysis. But they gave me something called tramadol. Five milligrams. Very mild. They gave me a 30-day script. And I took, it says as needed, one every, what is this, six hours, I think. I took one at bedtime every night. The rest, I did uh, aspirin and ta well, Tylenol mostly, but which I'm not supposed to take, but what you going to do? That's how I took that. And uh, it lasted me longer than 30 days. Not that I was trying, but it's just I didn't need it. I only needed it. It hurt more when I laid down is what it was. So I figured if I took one at night, that would help me sleep. During the day, I'm active. You know, I'm moving around so you don't feel the pain as much. Got to know your body. That's key. That's key to medications working. Is know your body. And they tell you to tell them, you know, if you have a high tolerance for pain or pain medication, I have both. I can really deal with some pain, like right now. And the average person will be crawling around the floor, crying out. But not me. I tolerate it. Why? Because in the military, they tell you, suck it up. <laughs> so after years of that, you learn how to suck it up. So your pain, your tolerance for pain is elevated. So I can take a whole lot. And for me to yell out, then you know that I'm in some pain. I'm like beyond the average person's pain by that time. But it doesn't matter. They tell you to let them know. And for what? They don't do anything about it. You know, they just don't. I'm done playing games. I'm telling you, I'm done playing games.
this, these are uh, what I'm going to say the golden years of my life, pretty much. You know, I'm at the tail end. Uh, I'm in the grandparent years. I know there's some that are young and are grandparents, but that's not my case. My kids didn't have kids till later after they established themselves, you know, in their careers. They actually came out good, those kids. <laughs> Did things the right way. I didn't even have to say anything. But anyway, and I'm not trying to waste my last years thrashing around in pain or living miserably. No, no, no. That's not what that Hippocratic Oath was about. That Hippocratic Oath gives me the right to get different care, to get care that gets me out of all of that so that I can regain some of my freedom back, you know, and living a good life, quality life. Doctors today, I swear they're a joke, most of them. You know, if you're a doctor and you're watching this, don't be like that. You know, and, and forgive me if you are and you take offense, please don't. You know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about those different from you. You know, if you're so scared of Uncle Sam, change professions, man, because you're not doing your patients any help. You know, no help, no justice, especially when the diagnosis is there. And you're going to sit there, talk about, oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in payments. Okay, that's good for you. Well, I believe in them. <laughs> you know, and you're my doctor. Are you supposed to help get me out of pain? I don't care how you do it. Just do it. You're the one with the, all, all the... Uh, Paid college and, and, and expertise and computer right there in front of you to find out how. It's crazy. Well, let me tell you what she did. <laughs> I tolerated so much. I tried to. Why? Oh, it's the VA. What you want to do? But I tried, I really tried to give people the benefit of the doubt um, but I'm not a fool and I won't be walked over or walked off okay after so many chances and I shouldn't have to explain myself any further if I do then there's definitely an issue and we're just not going to work out Let's say goodbye move on Wish each other well. Oh, hope each other well. And keep them moving. Find someone who can understand you. But look what she does to me. For nerve pain, this is in the beginning before she found out about my, about my tethered spinal cord. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her on and on and on and on and on. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many visits it took. But, she decides, because she thinks that my pain is from diabetic nerve pain, because I'm diabetic with insulin pump. So she prescribed something called gabapentin. I remember I had been on gabapentin before, and I didn't like it, because it made me too loopy. So I take it one month, and it takes a while, two, three weeks before it builds up in your system. And then the next month, I called in my refill. Oh, it, uh, my pills didn't come after I placed the order. I'm like, what is going on? So I had a follow-up, two-month follow-up, because that was a narcotic prescription, so she had to see me after two months. I had a two-month follow-up coming up, so I didn't say nothing. I didn't 
call her office complaining, hey, I ordered this and I haven't gotten it. I decided I'll just wait till I see her and I'll let her know. They were starting to help. I mean, yeah, it helped the shooting pain a lot. Didn't help my back any. Not that kind of nerve pain because that's all twisted. Okay. But the diabetic nerve pain, it did help. And that's one of the things they ask you is, are you good on your medications? Because if not, they'll push it in the system for you so you get an order. Or if you forget to order some, whatever. And uh, I said, oh, by the way, I didn't get my medication for February, my gabapentin. You know what she tells me? She looks in the sister. She said, well, it shows here that they shipped it out to you. I said, I'm sure they did. I said, I'm telling you I didn't get it. She said, <laughs> she implies. First, when I first went in and asked her for something for pain because of all the back issues, she was telling me about drug addictions and a lot of people are addicted to these pain medications and they come to the office and they ask for me. I'm looking at her, I said, are you telling me that you think I'm a drug addict? Like I'm addicted and that's why I'm asking you for pain meds? I said, let's run the test and you tell me if I don't have a good diagnosis to require some kind of a pain med. That's the first thing, she called me a drug addict. Then, <laughs> when I told her about the pills, me not getting them, she tells me uh, she's always implying, you know, uh, but she never calls you right out. Well, you know, a lot of people on these gabapentins, on these type of narcotics, you know, they sell their pills. <laughs> Since you call me a drug dealer now. Okay, first I was a drug addict, now I'm a drug dealer. I looked at her and said, now why, first of all, to whom would I be selling these to? I don't go anywhere, I don't know anyone but nurses and doctors. Secondly, why would I be selling a medication that is I'm in dire need of because I'm in so much pain that's helping me alleviate some of that pain why would i want to sell it what makes you think that i'm in that much need of money of cash i i don't i don't get it i'm not rich but my husband and i we're making it you know we're good <laughs> he works he's a veteran um 24 and a half years in service. This is retired. You know. So I was called a drug addict. Because I asked for pain relief. Or pain meds. And then. I was called a drug dealer. Because I told her I didn't get one of my bottles. One of my prescription bottles for the month. And she pushed and she got me another bottle anyway. <laughs> I'm like, and now she's not even responding. You know, to my concerns, to my illness, to my pain. Still not responding. So I think it's time that I say my goodbyes. Yeah, this is Rosemary, by the way. That I'm grinding up in here. I wish I could just open it up. I tried, but maybe I can. Oh, yeah. Oh, imagine that. All right. There's the rosemary. Here's the ginger. Okay. 
This I'll put in the jar, whole peppercorn. The bay leaves and the parsley, that will go in the jar directly. It doesn't get mixed up in here. Smoked paprika, if you have sweet paprika, Spanish paprika. Okay. And here's some garlic and onion powder mix. Okay. So this is sea salt. Okay. That was about two tablespoons. Alright, and then apple cider vinegar. Or just apple vinegar, or just regular vinegar, whatever you have. Okay. And then, of course, here's my crushed tomatoes with garlic. So this is all done. Only thing I have to do is the dill. I think that, yeah, the dill, the parsley, the bay leaves, the whole black peppercorn. And that is all she wrote. I have to toss this. And then I'm going to put the lid on it. But anyway, thanks for listening to me gripe about my medical care or non-medical care, I should say. You know, and it's so sad. And let me tell you, I'm not the only veteran that goes through. So when you hear people talk about their horror stories, please believe them. And I'm sure it's not just a at the uh, VA anymore. I'm sure that that non-compliance to the Hippocratic Oath is happening everywhere. You know, sadly, I think it's going to be better if I use my hands. So, all right. So. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go all the way around. This is your salad, you all. You follow these steps. Got to get all of that seasoning in there. Got to really dig in. Going all the way under, up, and over. Okay. Get a good mix. show you guys what I have and wash my hands so let me bring you in closer see 
There it is. Look at all of that right there. Sorry about that shuttle. Okay. That's the salad. So what I'm going to do is cover this up and let it marinate in there. I'll put it in the refrigerator out in the garage. I'm going to let it marinate overnight. Tomorrow I'll get my doors. I'll wash them out. And uh, I'll bring you back and we'll stuff them. Okay, guys. So here we are. This is the next day. And um, we're getting ready. I got my jars and I've washed them out, rinsed them out real well. And um, I've got my little colander in there that's going to help me to pack these in without making a mess everywhere, even though I'll probably still make a mess everywhere. <laughs> that's just who I am. <laughs> anyway, so we've got the salad. We're going to give it a good mix uh, with clean hands. Okay, we're going to go in here and toss this around and all this juice on the bottom, we'll go ahead and pour into the jars. Now, I'm going to start off with two jars. I may need more. See, these are already pickled a little bit from being in the refrigerator overnight. This is great. Okay, awesome. All right, half the work is done, huh? So let me rinse my hands out. Let me show you what I'm going to put at the bottom of my jars first. Okay, first of all, we're going to put in some bay leaves. Okay, about four. Let's put. Okay. Four in each. Whole black peppercorn. Ow, 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 ow. Okay. About a teaspoon in each. Okay. That's that. Now, like I said, I'm starting off with two jars. I may have to have enough left over for a third or the smaller ones. Okay, here I have some dill. And I'm going to put some in there. And put some in here. Okay, then I've got some parsley, which I've chopped up. You saw me chop up. Put some in there. And some in here. Okay. Oof. Then I've got some garlic. Okay. Handful in there, handful in there, okay. All right, now we're going to start in with, I'm going to my hands again. We're going to start with the vegetables. It's on the bottom, which we'll be putting in there, too. See, I told you I didn't make a mess. What's this? So I'm going to go ahead and finish stuffing these, and I'll be back when I need to finish it up and put the lid on it. Okay, well, I got one gallon and three little half pints 
of or cups of uh, the salad in there. Now I'm going to spoon in a tablespoon of sugar on each of these. Okay, activate that vinegar. And three and four tablespoons. I'll put four tablespoons in this big one. Okay. Then I'm going to go ahead and squeeze some lemon. And I'm going to take the juice that I've rendered from the vegetables. And pour it into the jars. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to go ahead, wash it out, and fill it up with water. And we're going to go ahead and just boil these for about 15 minutes to get all that sauce and everything mixed in there really well. Okay, so it's just not at the top. That heat will help it all sink down. So I'll be back with that. Don't close the lid all the way on your jars, just a loose fit, okay, and we're going to let this boil for 15 minutes. We're going to try to let all the air to rise up to the top, and when it's done, We'll go ahead and roll them and put a heavy blanket over them and cover them and leave them in a dark, cool place. All right, so I turned the burner off. Timer went off. 15 minutes have been up. Okay, these are still cool. These are a little hot, so I'm going to remove those. Let me get the blanket. I'll be right back. So here it is. We've got the big jar in here. I decided to wrap it up in this paper after it cooled down under the uh, blanket. I used a big towel. Anyway, so I decided to wrap it up in this paper. There's the big jar right here. Okay. 
And then here are the little bitty jars. I'm going to take one out because I think we're going to have some dinner tonight. We're having, I mean, some chicken tenders. This right here is a brisket that I'm going to season. We just got the cow. Hubster just got back. And so I'm going to season the brisket and then put it in the free, deep freeze uh, and take it out a uh, couple of days before Feast of Tabernacles dinner, which is coming up. And I'm doing my usual, cooking up a storm. I've got surgery on the 13th. Feast of Tabs on the 15th. Which means I've got to get busy around the 9th and start making all the side dishes and refrigerating them. Uh, and seasoning. I've got all the meat seasoned. Pretty much I got a turkey, a uh, whole turkey already seasoned and stuffed. And uh, it's in the freezer. And then I've got two chuck roasts that I've seasoned. I've got frozen vegetables that I've uh, seasoned um, and ready to go. And uh, I think that's about all I've done so far. So this one will be next. And then the leg of lamb, I've got to wait till it comes in. I think it's coming in on the 8th, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll get that seasoned. See, here it is. So, we're going to have this for dinner. This one. But, I've got the rest in here. And it'll stay in here until we use it. And this box is labeled, I'm pretty sure. I thought I labeled it. Yep. See? Pickled veggies. And we'll put it on the shelf out there in the garage. These two are empty jars. I'm using the box that the jars came in to store these in. Because eventually I'll get some more vegetables and fill these two up. Okay, and that'll be our winter vegetable, pickled vegetable salad. And that's going to be, it's so delicious. You all to try it. Make yourself some. Give me a thumbs up. I know this video is a little bit long. Our winter vegetables. Pickled. Okay. They last. Just store them, put them in a jar and store them, tighten the lid, the lid and real tight. Vacuum seal it if you can. And you're done. It's real simple. No refrigeration needed. Okay. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. Give me a thumbs up if you did. Okay? Subscribe. And when you subscribe, if you turn that notification bell on to the right, you will be notified every time I upload a new recipe. So, until the next one, be kind to one another. All right, let's be friends and take care of yourself and one another. May y'all bless you. Bye now. Have a good one. He'll be my shot. <laughs> Whoa, there we go. This will be my shot, you all. Boop. Bye now. Look at my dough biscuits, you all. Mm hmm Well, actually, the dinner rolls. Yep, yep, yep. Loving that recipe.